This sermon is from the series entitled Eyewitness Accounts, the Gospel of Luke, preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. Okay, I'm going to try and say this name. Vilif Atlason, in 2017, a 16-year-old teenager from Iceland, decided that he needed to speak to President George Bush. Now, here's the crazy thing. He claims he doesn't remember how he got the phone number, but he did get a pretty direct line. It wasn't actually to the Oval Office, but it wasn't to the switchboard either. And it was a, uh, so he, somewhere in the White House he got, a, uh, it got to. And he pretended to be the Icelandic president at that time, which is Ulfur Ragnar Grimson. I probably butchered that name too. Um, and he asked him, uh, they was asked a bunch of different questions about him to try and verify that he was who he claimed to be. Now, he answered those questions with the help of Wikipedia. And so uh, he was there and he kind of made his way up until he hit a secretary who he thought was the secretary at the Oval Office, who said that the president was busy, but would call him back. Well, Billif ended up with some special visitors. The CIA literally called the Iceland uh, police authorities and wanted to know who this number is that's trying to call the president. Now, <clears throat> they realized that it was a little bit of a prank and no charges were made. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's a pretty serious thing when you come to the president. There's a protocol that you need to have and not just anybody has access. Well, why do I start my sermon with this, this story? Well, because it's the exact opposite that I think sometimes we take for granted, that you and I, through prayer, can have a direct line to the creator God of the universe is pretty amazing. And it's something that we don't often think about, but we don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to do any of that stuff. Matter of fact, all we have to do is cry out to him and he is there. Now, it doesn't always feel like he's there. Sometimes we go through these moments of darkness of our soul and silence and all of those things but we still have access, and that is an amazing thing. So here at Crossway, we just preached through the book of the Bible, and we are going through the book of Luke. And we are going to go through Luke 11, verses 1 through 4. Um, and we're, Jesus is going to teach his disciples how to pray. They see that he prays, and they ask him, teach us how to pray. And so that's the title of the sermon. Um, Luke 11, verses 1 through 4, it's, this is the word of the Lord. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not in temptation. Now, if you learned the Lord's Prayer in another setting... Some of you might have learned thys instead of yours, right? Um, but also, you'll note that Matthew has a longer version of that. Um, and so if you're wondering why it's a little bit different, this is an abbreviated version. But I already stole one of my points right there, so you can fill in your outline. Before we dig into the content of the uh, prayer, I think it's important for us just to note, because it's easy for us just to scoop by the occasion. And the first thing that I think is important for us to note is that Jesus was a man of prayer. If you think about it, if you don't ask Alexa or Siri, uh, you know, how an answer for something because you want it immediately, or if you don't trust the answer she gives because, I mean, really, is that YouTuber as knowledgeable as we think they are? You usually, when you want to know how to do something, you ask somebody who's good at it. If you want to be a better athlete, you ask a good coach or you ask a better volleyball player or another player to teach you and to take you and to answer your questions. If you want to build, you don't ask somebody who's never built before. You talk to somebody who knows the code, who has experience, and ask them how to put together that shed. If you want to start investing, what stocks or mutual funds should I buy? Should I buy now or should I not? Or is crypto something I should look at? I hope that you would talk to a stock uh, uh, investor who actually knows what they're talking about rather than maybe some guy on the YouTube. But the fact of the matter is, is that when we do this, we realize that there's an authority in somebody, and we naturally ask those people who are in authority. And so what we see by the fact that the disciples actually asked Jesus about prayer and asked him to teach him is that Jesus was a man of prayer. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Gospels, he gets away and goes and prays 
both away and with his disciples often. And it's something that we often overlook. And so I think it's important for us to see that Jesus was a man of prayer. Now, as I said before, Luke has an abbreviated version of the Lord's Prayer that's found in Matthew. And so it's likely that Jesus probably taught on this topic of prayer often. Disciples would come to him, either the 12 or other disciples, and ask him to pray. They would see that he's a man of prayer. And so the fact that this is slightly different than the one in Matthew is not to be concerning. It's just likely that, Matt, that he taught it a couple of different times. And when you teach, if, you, if you've ever seen it, like a couple of weeks ago when I went and preached at another church, my teaching was probably slightly different, even though I used the same manuscript and had the same kind of a thing, because it's just a different way of teaching at a different moment at a different time. But it's also important to note that this is a prayer that the sinless Jesus doesn't have to pray. I mean, think about it. He asks for forgiveness when he is the one who grants for forgiveness. And so it's important for us. I know we call it the Lord's Prayer, but I think it's probably better that it's the Lord's prayer they taught to the disciples, because it applies more to us than it does to him. But I think this prayer is important, not just the words. I mean, we can go through the words, and actually we're going to close our sermon today reading the Matthews version of the prayer, because I think it's powerful. But I think there's some components to it, and actually the structure of it that's important for us to even think about our prayers. Often when we pray, we either pray because that's the way it was taught to us by our parents or by other people who played an important role in our lives, or we just naturally do it. And our natural propensity, I think, is that we just lay out our concerns to the Lord. This is what's bothering me, and this is what I'm going to share. And, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with bringing those requests to the Lord. Paul tells us that we can bring these things to him. But Jesus gives us a framework and gives us some things that we can think about that are probably outside of our natural inclination, and so I think it's important for us to look at it. He begins with the simple word, Father. Now, if you grew up in church or if you grew up with the Lord's Prayer, you may take that word for granted. I mean, it's a word, and we often use it, even in our prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, gracious God and Father. And to us, it may just seem kind of natural, but in Jesus' day, it would have been pretty radical. I mean, very rarely in the Old Testament, of all the hundreds of times that God is referred to, is he ever referred to as Father. And it's always in kind of a national level when it's the people of God. And so for Jesus, who had taught just in Luke 9 about his father and how he was going to display his father, to say to his disciples that they could use that language would have been actually pretty radical to them because it's an informal kind of language that they would not be used to when they talked about God. Now, the, fa the Greek word isn't Abba, but it has that same kind of paternal kind of thing. It's like daddy, or it's, it's not a formal name, father, which we may feel it's a little bit more formality, but to them it would seem more like daddy, a phrase that a younger person would use uh, uh, to show care to their loved one. What it reminds us of is that you and I can have a close relationship with the Creator God. I mean... That's pretty radical. That the creator God of the universe, who made the entire world that we see, the beauty, the mountains, the skies, the oceans, everything around us, who is infinite and above our comprehension, that we can still come to him and have a close relationship with him. Now, I know that term father is loaded for some people. Some of you had terrible fathers. And so even the concept of father, it may be difficult, but I want you to think of that most caring person in your life. And when you pray that word, father, think of it, because this is the image that Jesus wants us to have. The other thing that the word father reminds us of is that believers are part of the family of God. John 1 says, to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Born not of natural descent nor human decision, but of humans will or of humans will, but born of God. And then it goes into the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only one who came, talking about Jesus, and that's our way that we can have this. And so it's important for us to see this, that this is the way that this word father is a loaded word that we take for granted, but it communicates some pretty astounding truths. That Jesus says that we're part of the family of God, that even though God is above us and beyond us, and we'll see that he even reminds us of that in this prayer, that we can have a close relationship with him. 
As I said, my natural propensity, just who I am in prayer, if I don't think about it, is just to come to the Lord and give all my concerns and lay them out before him because I just want him to sense what's going on in my life as if he doesn't know it already. But there's something good about that. But Jesus doesn't go there. Rather, the second part of his prayer is completely God-centered and focused. He says, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And again, these words may be words that we don't use very often or concepts that don't really sink into us. And so even though we pray them, we may not always comprehend kind of what they're about. The term hallowed means to be made holy or to be made unique. And name, we think about it, is just kind of a name. I'm Brad. It doesn't really mean much more than that. But in the Near East, the name was very significant. I mean, a name was more than just how you refer to somebody. It was their character. It was who they were. It was the essence of of who they are. That's why Psalm 20 says that we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. It doesn't mean that they're just going to trust that he's got that, he's called something, but rather in everything that he is. And so when it says, hallowed be your name, what he's really saying and what we're really praying is, God, make your uniqueness known. Hallowed is a word that means to be made holy. Holiness reminds us of God's perfection and all of his, his eternalness. That he's completely perfect and he's completely unique. And so when we say, may your name be holy and unique throughout the world, what we're really declaring is that God's name would be unique and everyone would know it. There's a couple components to it. First, that we would make God's name known to the world and that that's what would happen. And two, that that, that God's name would be made known to the world. And two, that he would make his uniqueness and holiness known to us. Do you see that? There's two sides to this, right? The first is that it would be made known to the entire world, that more people would hear of who God is and sense his holiness so that they would come to faith in him. But there's the practical side as well, that God would make his uniqueness and holiness known to us. And I think this is the one where sometimes we want to glance over that. But it's good for us to think about a holy God, a unique God, That he isn't just somebody who, even though he is at some sense close to us and we can have a personal relationship, there's another otherness to him. And sometimes we can gravitate too much on that friendship and forget the otherness that we forget the holiness. We can do the opposite where we go only on the holiness and forget the closeness that we can have. But oftentimes we forget this otherness. And I think if we felt the weight of the holiness, if we felt the the weight of his uniqueness, if we felt the weight of his grandeur and who he was, it would have a greater impact on our lives. We we wouldn't make as light of some of the trivial sins that we do. We we would want this desire to, to try and be more like him, to show this off. And so when we pray, hallowed be your name, we pray that God's name would not only be made holy and unique in all the world around us, but that it would be in our own lives as well. I want you to think about this. Who do you revere the most? See, to be hallowed means that we revere them. And I think if we're honest, we sometimes revere more people. We care more about what other people think than God himself. It may be our parents. It may be our friends. It may be our spouse. It may be government officials. I mean, I can go on and on about the different kinds of people who we revere and who we have that allow to have that kind of voice in our life. And some of them, it's great. I don't want to minimize that. But if those voices reverberate louder and have more of a draw to our hearts than God himself, well, then we need to pray, God, hallowed be your name. May your name be unique in our own lives and may it play that kind of a role. The second phrase that we praise is, thy kingdom come. And what he says is, bring about your rule and kingdom. Kingdom is, is an, a concept that we've seen throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. That there's the people of God, and God's people are, are, God is going to create a, a new people that is Gentiles and Jews. And Jesus establishes that. That's what he says. He says, repent because the kingdom of God is near. That's how Mark starts. And so when Christ bursts onto the scene, the kingdom of God is made in a fresh way. But when Jesus calls us to pray, thy kingdom come, there's aspects to it. 
There's the first aspect that he would make God's name known. Oh, that's, the, that's where it went. I was like, I knew I moved that slide, but it moved it to under B instead of C. The prayer that Christ would come again and conquer the evil for all eternity. That's the prayer. But God would come in and that he would come and Christ would come a second time and establish his reign and conquer evil for all eternity. So there's a part of us that when we pray thy kingdom come, we look forward to that day when Christ returns and evil will be vanquished and we will get to spend eternity with God. And that's one of the things we pray for. One of the ways, though, that God's rule is shown in this earth is by people coming and putting their hope and trust in Jesus. And so when we pray, thy kingdom come, really what we're asking for is not just that Christ would come again for all eternity in his second coming, but also that others would come to know Christ as their Savior and acknowledge the kingship and acknowledge the kingdom rule that's already there. But also, it's also personal. When we pray, thy kingdom come, we invite God to rule our lives more, that we would submit more of our lives to him. And so this is where, again, we have this idea of revere or trust. Who do you trust more? Who do you care about more? Who has that kind of a role in your life? See, when you put the hallowed be your name and your kingdom come together, what it means is that we want God to have that unique place in our lives where we we make him the ultimate thing of our lives. And yes, we can enjoy the things of life. Yes, we can enjoy relationships, and, and we're created to have that. But that ultimately, his word and who he is dictates more of our lives than anything else, and it shapes more of who we are, and it's a process. But when we pray this God-centered prayer, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, This is what we're praying for. Now, I want you to think about this. Let's take some just practical steps. How can we take this? And so this week, I have a question in your sermon notes that I want you to think about. How can you incorporate these God-centered requests into your own prayer life this week? When you come to the Lord and when when you pray, maybe it's even just saying, you know what, I'm going to come and I'm going to spend some time today and every day praying. That would be a great step. But maybe it's even taking it, okay, I'm going to pray, but rather than just starting off with everything I want him to do for me, I'm going to do what Jesus encourages me to do and do a God-centered part. I'm going to ask that he reigns and that he takes over more of my life. I'm going to praise him for who he is. But think about those different ways that you can incorporate these God-centered requests. How can you put how be your name, your kingdom come in your own vernacular or in your own prayer life? But I encourage you to think about that and to cry and do it this week. Now again, our own propensity, well, I shouldn't put project to you guys. My own propensity is that prayer is often about me and my own stuff. But again, Jesus doesn't do this at the end of this prayer. Instead, his closing is a church-centered prayer. Now, why do I say church-centered prayer? Because these seem pretty personal. You're right. Give us our daily bread, forgive us our debts, and lead us not in temptation. Do. But there's one thing you got to realize here. It doesn't say give me. It says give us. It's a first-person plural. Man, my English teacher would love it when I did this, right? that I even know those terms. First person plural means us and we. And Jesus encourages us not to pray just on an individual level, but as disciples for each other. And I think this changes our prayer life too, that it's not just about God, it's not just about us, but it's about praying for others. And he lists three things that I think are important. First is that he gives us daily provision. Give us our daily bread. The image that's there is the image of the Israelites in the wilderness who were going through and they they were relying on God each and every day to give them what they needed. Now, some of us are in a spot where we literally need that. We don't know where the money's going to come from for our next paycheck. We don't know how we're going to afford inflation. We don't know how all this stuff is going to come. And, and we as a church body can pray for one another that God would provide their needs. We can also help each other that way. But there's daily provision even if we do have our needs met, that we remember that everything we have is a gift from God, not just our own earnings and our own work. Yes, we did that, but, 
but everything's a gift. And, and we can pray that people will have that truth sink deep into their hearts. Even though we may have all our needs met, we may, we may have other provisions, provisions for friendship, uh, pr- provisions for a spouse if we're single, or that relationships can be restored. There's all kinds of things that we can pray, but, but what we see here is that Jesus is encouraging us to start off praying for God and then praying for one another, that God would provide us what we need. And I think two things happen here that's important for us. One, it reminds us, again, like I said, that everything is a gift, and two, that we're dependent on God. And so I think this is why Jesus encourages us to do this. But there's another thing that he, require, or that he asks us to pray for, and that is this, that he gar- grants us gracious pardon. He says, forgive everyone, or forgive us our sins, for we also forgive the sins against, who sins against us. Now, as I said, Jesus didn't have to ask for forgiveness. He lived a sinless life. That's why I said it's a prayer that he teaches, not a prayer that he prayed. But even in that, that request for forgiveness and asking us to pray that God would forgive others, we got to be careful here because it's not that the forgiveness is like conditional. I mean, Christ paid for our sins fully on the cross. That is absolutely clear, that there's nothing that you and I can do to earn God's love. So, So if that's the case, then why do we need to pray for forgiveness? Well, I think it's important for us because it puts us in the right mindset. It reminds us of our spiritual weakness and our need for forgiveness. The forgiveness is already there in Christ. It's already been accomplished. When Christ says it is finished, it means that the debt has been paid in full. But it still is important for us to get rid of our own pride and think that we have all life figured out and that we forget that we are still broken, that we do hurt people, that we do hurt God with our sins. And we need to ask for forgiveness. And, and it's this asking God for forgiveness is, is really asking that, that we as a church and those that we love would have this spirit of humility where we're, we're quick to admit our own faults. When we ask, forgive us our sins and forgive the sins of those around us, this is really what we're asking for because the sin has been paid for in full. But the other thing he says is that he empowers us to forgive those who sinned against us. He says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now, this is kind of hard sometimes, right? Let's just be honest. There are people who get under our skin who we can have bitterness and anger towards. And Jesus even acknowledging this, that we we need to forgive everybody and asking us to pray corporately that we would have empowered to do that reminds us that that's exactly the case. And so Jesus encourages us and invites us to not only pray for daily provision, not only create this feat of weakness and admit our own brokenness before the Lord, but he encourages us to pray for one another that we would be empowered to forgive those who sinned against us. Now, here's the thing. (laughs) To have powerful prayers like this, we have to admit that we actually struggle sometimes with with forgiving people. And we actually have to let other people know that, which, whew. But this is the kind of church that we're called to be. And even if you don't know who the people in your midst are struggling to forgive, we can still pray that prayer. We can still pray that God would make us a church that's aware of our brokenness and that we, empowered by the forgiveness that God has given us, can forgive others. Because this is a powerful thing, that we can show the world that God's name is hallowed and that his kingdom is coming. The last thing that Christ prays for is that he would provide spiritual protection. He says, lead us not into temptation, Now, what this is, is it admits us that we are in a spiritual battle. The Bible makes it clear that we battle two different things. Our own internal evil desires that are part of the fall and external spiritual forces. In Romans 7, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest leaders of all time, says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is my own sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. This is the guy who was shipwrecked for his faith, who did all kinds of amazing things, and yet he was so aware of his own brokenness that we just talked about 
that he also could come and admit that he still struggles with sin. And what praying this prayer, lead us not into temptation, is really a prayer that admits that we're in a battle. We're also in a battle, as Paul says, against our, in Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so there's external forces and internal forces that work inside of us trying to lead us astray. Now, now that right there, we just have to let sit for a little bit. Think about that. We're in a battle. Internal and external forces want to, to get us away from the Lord. And so it's important for all of us to be praying for one another. Now, I trust that God will work and that he'll be secure that if we put our hope and trust in Jesus, we'll persevere in faith. The Bible makes that clear. But that doesn't mean that we still don't pray that prayer for one another, that it's important for us to do it because, for one, we're commanded to do it, and two, because we want to have that kind of mutual accountability and respect and care for one another. And so we pray, Lord, lead us not in temptation. Not lead me, lead all of us not into temptation. And so we ask God to lead believers away from these temptations, that we, we would not suffer the consequences of evil desires in that. This is the prayer that Jesus lays out. Now, again, my own propensity myself is to, to go to those things naturally that I, I do, You'll see that Jesus doesn't even list them here. Instead, what does he focus on? He focuses on the God-centered stuff, the church-centered stuff, and he figures we can figure out the own request ourselves, right? But this week, I want to encourage you to think about that. What are these church-wide prayers that you can pray for the people here, and not even just this congregation, the whole church in general? Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Help us to forgive one another and lead us not in temptation. What are ways that you can incorporate those things? Figure out your own lingo, language, vernacular. But I want to encourage you to follow the model that Jesus has given us where prayer isn't about us. Rather, it's about God and other people. Now, I can't think about a better way for us to do that and to close this sermon by rather having us do it ourselves. And so I'm going to put up the words because we've all learned very slightly different versions of this prayer, right? Some of us know thy, some of us know none, some know debtors. The language is different, even depending on where you, some of them don't have for thine is the kingdom and the power. And if you'll notice, it's not in Matthew, but I like it. It is in some of the older texts. And so I added it to that part. But I think it's important for us to spend some time praying for this and praying for these things. And so I noticed that I forgot to cut uh, this in two chunks, but we'll, you, you can make it work. It will be there. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.